they are making after talking with their clients. So that, that's the reason for bringing that up and putting it on the record because five years down the road, ten years down the road, you're in another habeas court somewhere else if this case is on appeal and you don't know what the arguments are going to be made. Can you expound on what uh, Vic said earlier about this being an unusual case and you almost cover murders with knives and guns. This didn't have either one of those. Mm -hmm. how, how unusual is this and how challenging? It was very challenging in that, I mean, it's almost like you're proving, proving a negative to start with. You know, you see all this evidence, evidence circumstantially, just the minimum part of it, and you're, you realize, and you start looking at it, you know, did this person do this intentionally? And so you have to start from that standpoint. It's not like you have a, a murder on video or a shooting or anything like that. It's the mechanism of injury, and I think the level of evil it took to commit this type of act also is something different than we usually see. Because usually there's a reason, and while it's still murder, okay, you got ripped off in a drug deal, or there's domestic violence or something like that. This case was so far different than what we usually see in our homicide cases. And you and I have talked before, what feeling or comments did you get from the jurors about the, how they handled that evidence? And handled I, I think they absorbed it. Uh, in a very systematic way. I think the first day, talking to the four person and a couple other people, uh, the first day they were kind of, you know, working their way through how do they go through this process. And then they uh, created a plan where they were going to go through and discuss each issue. And when they did it, each juror was going to be allowed to have their say so no one would feel like they were left out of being able to deliberate. But when speaking with them, uh, they, they didn't seem to have, they were very thorough in their examination of the evidence, but they really didn't have a lot of questions about the evidence once they had gone through it. Chuck, this is the max sentence. It's one thing to win the case, but then for attorneys, um, this sentencing is sort of the finality of this. What's your reaction to it? I really think it's the only sentence that reflects the verdict in this case. I don't think you could have any other sentence that would be appropriate uh, when somebody's been convicted of intentionally taking the life of a 22-month-old child. Not only doing that, but doing it in such a painful, deliberate way. To follow up on what Debbie just said, reporters learn that we put stories behind us because, as I tell my wife, if we don't go crazy, we go crazy. Looking at this case, is this something that's going to be with you for a while? Can you put this behind you, or do you need time to work out what, I mean, basically what happens? Yeah, I don't think you anybody involved in this case will ever be able to put it behind them, so to speak. I think we're all going to keep it with us for one reason or another. Different things we may have learned about the case, about evidentiary issues that came up that we've never encountered before that we had to research. Um, it was just such a, 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 an overwhelming case as far as the investigation. Things that we learned that we could have done differently maybe. I think in, in that respect we're always going to keep that with us. But I think also, you know, everybody involved in this case is going to remember it because of that victim. And so we'll move on and we'll keep doing our jobs and we'll keep seeking justice for children and victims of crime. Uh, so in that regard, we're going to move on, but I don't think any of us will move on or forget this. Anything else, guys? Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you.